So welcome uh, to the first lecture of AMA, Advanced Macroeconomic Analysis. This is really by way of introduction to the field and to the way um, Lutz, Weinke, and I have tried to approach this first semester. It's an introduction that everyone has to take, in fact. So can I just ask, are every, is everyone in the, I mean, everyone who I know should be in the, um, in the BSE program? Are there any master's students, like curious masters? Sometimes we have masters wandering over here from Spandauer Straße. No? OK, so it's a small BSE program. Or maybe people forgot. Please come at 8.30 on time so we can get the, the, the film going. It's, it's, un, it's unfortunate when people interrupt the, the, um, the filming. Um, so my lecture today is, is going to be about an hour and 45 minutes. And we'll have a 30 minute break. And then we'll finish uh, with sort of another mini lecture. So it's, it's, this is light material I'm giving you today. But it's, it's kind of important. And the, fl the slides will be made available afterwards to give you an incentive to pay attention and not just sort of doze off, which people tend to do. And um, you can also uh, subsequently watch a recording. Hopefully, Jakob will do a great job editing the <laughs> what we're doing. OK, so we'll start with some administrative details, uh, not to, to be too boring. I want to give you an overview of what macro is about. It's about two things. And we'll be mostly concerned in this course with the first. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a growth uh, macro uh, mandatory sequence uh, in the first semester, but we are looking at something like that in the second semester. Um, and certainly, there will be um, optional courses or electives that you can take in your second year. I'd make some general remarks on macro from my point of view. And I think a lot of people share this uh, perspective. Uh, macro has a lot of open questions. And we're really lucky. Uh, as a scientist to be challenged by the events of the, of the last few uh, months. I mean, I don't know if you understood this, but I certainly have that um, uh, many of our models are, are, are on the, uh, um, on the, uh, in the, in the crucible, as it were, being tested. Um, German, you say, auf dem Prüfstand. So it's being, it's really, a, a, there are serious challenges to some of the theories we have, and this is a good thing because um, there's a multiplicity of theories that map into a, ser a set of reality um, uh, facts that we have. And the question is to choose the best model. And I'd like to talk about how to do that. Again, this is general. I think this is also applicable for a lot of people do micro. Um, I'm going to talk, therefore, about what a model is and what model uh, a good model would be in this point of view. And then I'm going to talk about tools that we use. And that's the, this course. This course is about. Uh, using some mathematical statistical uh, ideas that give us a way of modeling agents' behavior under uncertain environments. Because macro is all about uncertainty and looking forward and taking decisions today that reflect expectations of the future. So that's kind of the, I call this the Sargent perspective, um, because Tom Sargent's book with uh, Lars Lundqvist uh, makes this very clear. Okay, And then um, I'd like to use the, the section, the, uh, or the recitation, if you want, uh, if you'd rather call it that, um, as an, a, a chance to use the math to, to implement a very simple model that everyone has seen as an undergraduate in some form or another, and show how that implies a lot of interesting f things for the data. And then we may have to make some additional assumptions to make additional uh, progress on understanding the nature of the drivers of the, of the cycle, which is the ASAD, aggregate supply or demand uh, setup. OK, so admin details, I expect you guys to have some, some serious uh, encounter with, with, with macro. I, said, I made that clear on the Moodle page. Um, before you come here, I mean, so you're in the PhD program or you're a master's student in advanced stage. Uh, if you're a bachelor, I, you know you can listen, but you can't take it for a grade. I can't give you a grade. You won't be recognized by our examination office. So just to get that out of the way, uh, that's the, the Humboldt uh, Prussian setup. Um, I expect you to be comfortable with, with using some math. You don't have to be a mathematician, but being willing and open to, to accept math as a, as a language for transmitting ideas, okay? Because it's a, economics is to a large extent an, an axiomatic exercise. We assume agents have this behavior, or behave like this, and then we de derive the implications. And then we can test it using data or test it using experiments. 
right? We can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Experiments is not something that macroeconomists do uh, very often, but I won't rule out anything these days. Um, <laughs> we also have natural experiments, things that happen uh, by the hand of uh, powers that be, and uh, we can observe the, the consequences under the, the assumption that indeed those were exogenous events. Um, I told you about the Moodle page. Please visit that page. Register for the course so we can get in touch with you in case uh, there's a change of plans. There'll be one lecture that uh, I can't make because I'm giving a paper in Copenhagen, so that would be a good reason to, to, to arrange an alternative lecture in that week. It'll be in November, the end of November. Um, there's a final exam. Um, this slide is slightly uh, outdated because in the time of the pandemic, we had a single exam, now we're gonna have midterms. So there'll be a midterm for me in December, and then I'm just, I don't see you anymore. And then you'll be dealing with Lutz until the end of the semester, and he will give you another, uh, call it a midterm, call it a final, call it whatever you want, it's another exam. So uh, this is to separate clearly uh, what we do. Um, I think it will give you more of a, uh, an incentive to, to listen to what I'm doing. My experience in the past years has been that people sort of put it in low gear, do all the micro, uh, midterms uh, diligently and the problem sets, pay attention to the micro, learn a lot about game theory and, and sub-game perfection, and then they remember, oh, there's a macro course. Uh, I, I don't like that. <laughs> so I've, Lutz and I have agreed that uh, we'll give you at least one uh, feedback, and that'll be my midterm, and they'll count equally. So you take it seriously, come to the, the second half of the lecture and take notes, and we'll solve problems together. Um, I'll talk about that in a second exactly one second. So the final exam for my part, the, the midterm, the uh, abschließende Klausur for my part will be correlated with the problem sets, correlation of about 0.8, okay? So if you understand um, what I'm doing in the problem sets, you will do okay, uh, but you have to do it on your own and it's not, a, it's not an open book exam, okay? So you have to solve the problem in real time and it's an applied problem. So it'll be a problem that you haven't seen in the same exact same form, but you'll recall, hey, that looks like this or that looks like that. And then you can, you can do that. It's a 90 minute um, test. Okay, so I have this, this repetition that starts around 10.30, 10.45. So that means that the first part is more like a lecture, but it's interactive and this is a small group and I'd, I'd welcome your, your questions and, and challenges. And if you don't understand something, if I'm not clear, uh, that's fine. And today we we'll, won't have any problems to look at, but I'll just take you through a, a great example, I think, of what, what we're doing. Um, and please take notes. I mean, I, th I think it's uh, crazy. First to ask me for the slides beforehand, so don't even ask that question. <laughs> I don't like that question. Um, the challenge of an interaction is that you have to also absorb and not maybe later uh, uh, or you know, even before. It's, it's like in real time, it's an interaction. And, uh, this is even more so in, in courses that I record and give people a chance to watch the video beforehand so you can really ask questions in real time. So you just came in, right? And you're a, a master's student? Uh, I was in uh, Erasmus Exchange. Are you the, the bachelor guy? I'm a master. Okay, you're a master. Okay, I can't hear you because of the map. Uh, yes, Kudos for wearing it, that's good. Um, as soon as things get worse, I'm gonna start wearing one too. But, um, <clears throat> If you're a bachelor, you can only watch this for visual effects. I mean, I can't give you a grade, and I'm, fr yeah, 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 it's fine. So Erasmus is great, thank you for coming. Uh, anything to fill up the place, that's good. <laughs> okay, um, and there's a Woody Allen rule. Does anybody know what the Woody Allen rule is? Does everybody know who Woody Allen is? A lot of people, you know, you're all young, d dynamic people, you probably don't watch movies that I watched. <laughs> Woody Allen, famous American actor who's gotten in some trouble lately. Uh, he's, he, he basically said 90% of life is being there. So 90% of this class is being here, <laughs> okay? So show up, don't skip this class because I move very fast and it's even more so with Lutz, Lutz Weinke. So, you know, we, we spend our time with you, spend some time with us. And in, in, in case you miss it, you can always go to this, but you know, you may miss something important. There's a book. If you're interested vaguely in macroeconomics, buy this book. You can buy it online, used. Um, I've maybe been able to get my hands on all of them, okay? And you, it's, a, it's, a, it's the Bible of modern macroeconomic techniques. Okay, it's by Lundquist and Sargent. 
It's called recursive macroeconomic theory. We only use the first three or four chapters. The rest of it is an incredible reference for anything you might want to do in this field. Okay, so I really strongly recommend it. And prices have probably gone down because people don't use books anymore. So um, I, I strongly recommend you looking at that book. It's in its fourth edition now. There's a fifth edition allegedly coming out. Sargent also has another book, um, which I have a couple of chapters from the internet, and I'll, I'll assign those at, at certain times. Okay, any questions about that? So it's pretty straightforward. Um, in the PhD program, we don't have a qualifying exam. This is the qualifying exam. So if you do poorly in this exam uh, and subsequent macro exams, you're not going to get a, a, an advisor very easily. So take it seriously. If you like this stuff, and when I say macro, I mean business cycle theory, monetary macro, I mean economics that has to do with the environment, that has a macroeconomic flavor. Okay, so growth theory, uh, what we saw yesterday at the DIW seminar, the Schumpeter seminar with uh, David Amos, you know, um, those kind of models. Um, this is, uh, and also labor economics. So you might want to answer that. <laughs> okay, so what are we interested in this course? We're interested in, in the big picture. Um, we're interested in the aggregative uh, indicators that steer our lives. We, we, care, we care about things like unemployment. We care about things like inflation. And the Germans kind of have forgotten about inflation. Suddenly we have 8 9% in one year. So that's really quite a, a shock. <laughs> it's a real shock. And it's a shock for uh, many people who thought that everything was done correctly here. Um, we have a good story for it in our field. But we need to tell that story. Um, and there are many other stories. A lot of people would blame the ECB for printing too much money. It's a bit too short-sighted. You know? it's, it's a bit ideological. If you don't like Europe, you go for the ECB and try to cut the head off. But in the end, there's a, it's a much deeper story than that. And that's what especially Lutz's part, when he talks about the Phillips curve and the aggregate supply um, of, the, of the economy in detail, is about. But no matter what your ideological feelings are, you care about this. You care about things like migration. Why does migration affect the capacity of a country or a region to produce more GDP, but also may affect the unemployment rate. And what does that have to do with the labor market? So these are sort of macro questions uh, that we need microeconomic uh, intuition for, because macro used to be John Maynard Keynes looking at C plus I plus G. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're much, much for farther along the road. His ideas are still right to a large extent, but we need to justify them by appealing to microeconomic behavior. Okay, either optimizing behavior or satisficing behavior or rules of thumb behavior, but we need to do that. So the, the, the standards on a PhD uh, in, in economics nowadays and macroeconomics is about trying to justify why we think one macroeconomic theory is better than another. Okay, that's, that's probably a fair way of summarizing it. So micro is serious. I, I'm a big fan of microeconomics. I make I poke fun at my micro colleagues sometimes, but you need that stuff. You can't do macro alone, right? And the best PhD programs in, in the UK and the United States require all that stuff, okay? And that's why we try to do that. We're trying to be like, we're like Zweite Liga. We're trying to catch up with the big guys, uh, and we have some good people, but we need to force the students uh, in these formative uh, semesters to do the right thing. Okay, so here are the, ob the objets d'intérêt, the things we're interested in. Uh, we're interested in, in growth and cycles. Some things are growing secularly over time, and some things are cycling. And for, the, for, the, for reasons of political economy, we care about the cycle more than we probably should, because the most striking thing about life is that growth is what has made us much better off than our grandparents. Yeah, come in. You're late. You're late, but just come on in and sit down. Yeah, I am too. We're recording, okay? So try to be on time. Anyway, so we have the GDP. So we can complain about that as a measure of, of, of welfare, but it's all we got right now. If we want to save the world, we want to reduce CO2, uh, we need to have GDP to do that. We have to pay people to research on ways to solve that problem or ways to abate the pollution that we're creating, right? So GDP is kind of a measure of, I'm not gonna to try to justify your PhDs, you understand this. When I teach bachelors, I have to explain this. 
but you don't need that. Okay? We know that GDP is incredibly correlated per capita with happiness. So being happy, uh, you don't necessarily have to have high GDP, but if you don't have high GDP, you're unlikely to be happy. Okay, that's kind of a statistical fact. So for, health re for better health care, better you know, longevity, um, less jealousness, less ethnic strife, having a high GDP is a good thing. So we like that. That's growth, but we also care about the cycles. The cycles are also important, uh, politically more important than they should be because in the end, what the, what the long run is, is uh, that we're wealthier. We talk about the change in the rate of, uh, rate of change in the, the level of prices, the price of goods and services in terms of the monetary unit, which is changing secularly over time at different rates of change. We're talking about interest rates. We're talking about unemployment rates. So these are real and monetary things that are interacting possibly at very, very high frequency. And then we have the external uh, accounts, which we won't talk about much in this course, but if you're interested, take Leopold Cessna's um, course in the next, I guess it's next semester. If you really like macro, you can do it right away. You can wait a year to finish macro one and two. Uh, it's international monetary economics, which is really in interesting. Models of exchange rate, models of the current account, models of external indebtedness. And, 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 and crisis, basically. So growth is important for me, but I'm not going to talk about it. So I just want to put this up there because this is what, what inspires, um, you know who said this? One of my heroes, Nobel Prize laureate. Nobody? Take a guess? Ironically, he's not really known for this. He wrote one or two papers that people really quote a lot, but Lucas, okay, Nobel Prize um, by himself, and he was, he was one of the first persons, like Romer, to push constant or increasing returns in the factor that can be accumulated as a source of growth. Okay, so again, we need, we're grasping for straws. Why is it the case that Honduras and North Korea had the same GDP per capita in 1960, and now look where they are? Okay, what, what did they do wrong in Honduras? Or what did they do right in South Korea? Well, that's why Lucas was so inspired by this. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Even though when I talk about it, I always get goosebumps. I still have to talk to you about it. Because that's the big, the big thing. That's the, the Lucas growth phenomenon. So economic historians have tried to reconstruct uh, GDP accounts, even though they didn't exist before 1945 or so, um, and have had some pretty interesting success with it uh, and showing this sort of hockey stick movement in uh, no matter how you price it, basically, it's a, it's a fairly robust fact that we're really exponentially growing since, since 1850. Um, and economic historians are fascinated by that. Now, if you take, if you take that looking, that, in, you know, you might say, well, that's, is that impressive or not? Uh, if I look at Argentina, I also get something like a hockey stick, but it's a different one. So the natural thing for us to do, for you to do, when you start doing macro seriously, is to take logarithms of those data to see if there's a growth rate that's stable over time, okay? So we take the Napierian logarithm, the natural log. And I'll use notation. Sometimes I'll use ln. Sometimes I'll use log. It's always implicit, base e. Okay? And when you take the logarithmic function of some variable um, here uh, as a function of time, you end up transforming, um, we say you flatten it. If the thing is growing at an exponential rate that's constant, you're going to get a flat result. I'm going to show you that this beautiful hockey stick suddenly becomes a flat line, okay? And again, the math is easy. If, if, the, if the exponential function is just e times the growth rate times t, and you take the log of that, you're going to get r times t, okay? And that's the key. So when you start doing econometrics with time series data, this is one of the first responses if you do any sort of analysis. Let's look at the logs. Let's look at the logs in the raw form. Let's take first differences and see if, if those first differences are relatively constant over time, or does it, does it change over time, is there a trend? Okay. 
And just keep in mind that this is an approximation, but for small changes, uh, we can use that as a, as a proxy for the growth rate. Growth rate taken in the usual sense of today's value minus yesterday's value divided by yesterday's value times 100. Okay? So again, this is just to remind you, this is stuff that, that my professors, when I was in graduate school, told me. And I said, oh, yeah, I know that from high school. Yeah, that's easy. But when you start applying it, it becomes really challenging, right? You start to have to think, OK, do I really know this? Can I do this with a minus sign? What if it's shrinking? And we know exponential growth is important, right? The rule of 70, you know the rule of 70? Very important in economics, even if we do non-growth theory. So if I take the log transform, look what I get. It looks pretty flat, doesn't it? We can, dis we can discuss whether it's completely flat. We see lots of deviations, but remarkably, Germany, after this terrible conflict, uh, comes back to the trend. Same is true of the UK and France. And the same, the same is actually true for the United States, although their dip um, is coming from a different source. It was the Great Depression. Okay, so there seems to be something there. Unfortunately, we're not, we're not gonna do this in this course, although I'd love to teach a growth course. <laughs> but um, this will give me the chance to explain to you that if you're doing growth theory, you usually go for a continuous model framework, and we're not gonna do that either. Okay, so there are two ways of looking at data over time, which is what macro is about. You can think of a continuous function of time, or you can think of a discrete function, discrete intervals. And because macro data are observe, observed every quarter, if you're lucky, every month, if you're in finance, maybe every day or every second, uh, it's still discrete. It's not a continuous. So models that we want to develop in this course are not going to be continuous time models. In growth theory, yes, but not in this, in this course. So a con continuous time model is like a, um, if you make the interval small, eventually you get something that looks continuous. That's kind of the way I like to, to propose it. We're going to spend most of our time thinking about discrete time. So the, the analog in discrete time would be the power of one plus some trend growth rate to, and the, the power is t, the index of time. And the, the, the index is, uh, is the set of integers, okay? So that's where I'm gonna go for the rest of this course. But the law of logarithm still works. You take the law of the function generating, the gen data generating function for yt, and you get a linear function of one plus g, uh, of, of which you take the logarithm, and approximately the log of one plus g is equal to, is g, right? First order Taylor approximation of that. And therefore, we can take first differences of a logarithm, well, logarithmic function of a series, a time series, and the first differences are approximately the growth rates. So again, this is stuff that you should have seen maybe, but if not, it's worth seeing it now. Okay, so here's an example of that trick applied to the UK. What have I done here? This is UK data, it stops in 2000, so it's a, bit, it's a bit old, but it's a really great picture. That red line is not a linear trend. It's a trend that I just pulled out of a hat somewhere. I have some method of generating it. And the yellow line is real GDP in constant prices for the UK. So what do you see? You see a trend, and you also see this, these fluctuations. And they're pretty big. And you can identify them with Margaret Thatcher or Heath or anybody, you know, any sort of politician who was in charge or a central banker that pulled the plug or raised interest rates. Um, does anybody have an idea where the trend comes from? In a, in a, how would you do a trend? How would you find a trend? Just, just want to see where I'm, who I'm dealing with here. Because and this, is what, this is what the data give us, and this is what I'm, I'm telling you is the, but I don't, I mean, I could, it's, 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 there is no such thing as, a, as the trend. We have to detrend. And you, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what it looks like the curve is using. Yeah. So you, you take out, or you're trying to take out the fluctuation. Yeah, and there's a way to do that, exactly. And there's a very robust way to do that. It's called the Hodrick Prescott filter. And many of you have seen that somewhere, I know. Okay, it's a, it's a least squares problem. I try to minimize the sum of squares to the trend subject to some smoothness criterion. And if the smoothness criterion is really, it's like a Lagrange multiplier. If I make that really, really hard, 
then it's going to be a straight line. And in this particular case, you can see this is not a straight line. Right? There's a, there's a little bit of a slump in growth here. And then we got an acceleration. And this is an atheoretical way of picking out that trend. It's, it's, it's literally a least squares problem subject to a smoothness constraint. And that smoothness constraint is like a dial. And when you turn it up really high, that means you get a straight line. If you turn it low, what happens if you turn it really down low? The lowest possible setting, just intuitively. You get the data again. So the, the trend is the data. So you have that whole spectrum of possibilities, right? And that's, that's something you'll do later, if you, if, in, perhaps in Lutz's course or in, in later courses in your own research. A, a gut reflex of anyone facing data with a trend is to take logs, take the Hodrick Prescott out, and see what happens. And when you do that, look what happens. We'll give an example. This is Germany, OK? This is a bit more modern. And just before this financial crisis, and then we had this financial crisis, <laughs> right? This is kind of shocking. Large, largest drop in GDP since the Great Depression. And uh, if you do the HP trends, that's what it looks like. Notice how the trend is kind of, it's tracking this drop. Okay, so this is kind of a weakness of the HP trend. It, the HP trend doesn't have a brain. It doesn't try to say, oh, that was just the financial crisis. It probably wasn't the destruction of German capital, physical capital. It was probably just some banks uh, going under uh, or some people getting scared. Uh, but you see how Hodrick Prescott doesn't get that. Hodrick Prescott is atheoretical. It just fits that trend. And therefore, we're going to have definitely a bust here, but it's not going to be as big as it should be probably. And I'll show you that. OK, so that's, the, that's the, the deviations from the, um, from the trend I just showed you. It should be bigger, OK? But if you're working here at the DIW, you would probably tell people in public, and it's still true, it's a really sharp downturn, OK? Notice that the downturns are getting bigger and bigger. Why do you think that's the case? The downturns and the upturns. So the, did I do something wrong here? Yeah. It's because the financial sector is getting more important and more volatility. Well, that's an interesting idea. That, I didn't think about that one, but that's not what I wanted to hear. It's, this is even more mechanical. Yeah. It could also be international migration. Oh. Very smart, but very smart. Germany is becoming more globalized. The, the share of exports in Germany has increased from 20 some odd percent in the 90s to now it's 45, 48%. That's also not what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah? Good. OK. That's what I wanted to hear. It's just a simple, trivial explanation. I didn't take logs. Had I taken logs and done the trend, I would have had prob uh, most certainly equally volatile fluctuations at the beginning and the end. But because I didn't do that, I committed a cardinal mistake. Someone would criticize me and say, hey, did you take, are you controlling for the size of Germany? You know, and the answer is no. And I did that on purpose to kind of stimulate your thought a bit on that. And you can see that um, other stuff moves with GDP. So during this recession, this horrible recession, wages and salaries fall. Even though unemployment didn't rise as much as it did in the United States, a lot of salaries were cut. And what was that? What happened in Germany, the great, the great uh, financial crisis? Why did the Germans get praised for the, their dealing with the great financial crisis? Anybody? Characteristic in, sort of trait of the German economy? If there's a downturn, what happens? Does the company lay you off? Less likely than in the UK or the United States, they pay you short time pay, right? That's a German institution. There's, there's similar stuff going on in Austria and I think in uh, some Scandinavian countries. But it means you, you get a pay reduction. That's part of the, the deal. You have to accept that. Otherwise, you're not going to have a job. So that's one way of explaining this little dip in, in a different macro variable, right? This is pretty interesting, right? Pretty striking. And um, wages and salaries uh, do seem, and this is GDP, sorry, this is, this is the wage and price uh, 
Actually, it's still rising. <laughs> OK. Um, in any case, the, uh, the hourly wage certainly fell. There's no question about that. So people are getting the same pay. Um, here's the United States after the great uh, financial crisis. So here you see uh, uh, an interesting development, which is that the, the US still, and Larry Summers, Professor Summers at Harvard has, has said this several times, that GDP has not yet recovered its trend of previous, um, previous upturns. Okay, here's the HP. This is, a, this is first differences in the log. So this is growth rates. And this is um, um, after you take logs. And if you take sort of piecewise linear trends for these sub-periods, you see that things have slowed down. So it makes you wonder, you know, this strict separation of trend versus cycle is also subject to criticism. So don't take anything uh, for granted. Um, we still do it because there's nothing, for de mieux, there's nothing else we can do. Right? We're, we're sort of, we're stuck with this, with me with this method. Now, I, here's the pandemic. So it gets even more interesting. What kind of, what kind of disturbance is this? The US uh, economy, uh, in, in a matter of a quarter, lost uh, considerable GDP, considerable output uh, per year on a quarterly basis. And if you look at this, you see several things happening at once. First, US output drops. You see that oh, this is 10% peak, peak to trough, so it's considerable. But you also see that US output has recovered. Um, it's recovered at least to its previous level before the, before the crisis. Employment also declined, but it didn't decline as much. On the recovery, it's, it still hasn't recovered. So this means that, um, I'm sorry, it, it, it declined more. And therefore, um, in terms of its uh, recovery, it not, has not recovered the level yet. So this implies that basically GDP per employed person, a measure of productivity actually went up. OK, so that's kind of a puzzle in itself. And you can see it right here. And when productivity rises uh, relative to wages, uh, that usually means the wage, the real wage, as a the wage as a fraction of GDP uh, actually goes down. OK? And if you look at the uh, data recently, we have this puzzle. That this is the, this, the stuff you saw just recently. And then now we've got this increase in the share of GDP afterwards. So these are all the puzzles that we have to explain using macroeconomic models. Um, in Germany, the situation was somewhat different. You had a big drop in output, uh, a bigger drop in output. Employment dropped by less. So productivity actually fell. So two very different qualitative outcomes uh, from the same macro shock. The COVID shock is really kind of a common shock, hitting all the countries in, in, a, in, a, in a very similar way. So these are things you can actually use um, to inform theory. So that's what I want to do now, talk about theory. So my very sort of broad brush stroke uh, approach to thinking about theory and models. And many of you have seen this before because you've taken my, my course before. But I, I say it anyway. So we've already established that the objective um, is, to, um, is to get this bird's eye view. But there are two sub-objectives. Sub One is to understand the facts. And this is good for microeconomists as well as macroeconomists, just being able to understand um, what's the fact about GDP and GDP's growth over time and its correlation its covariation with different uh, other variables of interest. But just like a doctor, you don't want to just understand uh, the symptoms. You want to be able to make a diagnosis. So you want to actually um, explain these uh, facts in a consistent way that you can apply to new situations, new countries, new, uh, new uh, contexts. So a great example is what we're facing right now. How do you, how do you make sense of what's happening uh, after the 500 plus percent increase in gas prices that uh, Europeans have to uh, pay when they when their contracts expire with with their suppliers. And if you're like Germany, heavily into energy intensive manufacturing, this is a real problem. Not just as an energy input, not just because we all use gas to heat our our homes, but also because we're using gas to to fire the furnaces that make uh, ceramics and uh, chemical manufacture, and general electricity generation. So 
you know, if we understand the, the facts, they help inform the theory that's going to help us understand whether the theory is doing a good job right now. Right? So we'll talk about that in the second hour, whether it makes sense to, um, uh, to pursue the same model, because we're, now we have an extreme event. This is outside the realm of experience. So this is one of the things that struck me very early on this summer, is we've never seen this before. It's like the OPEC uh, oil price increases of the 1970s. When I was a kid, um, the price of oil went up by 300% on world markets. You know? And the U.S. was importing a lot of oil, so I was seeing people line up to get gasoline. This was outside the, nat the normal experience, and we're seeing the same thing in Europe now, uh, not just a, an armed conflict, but we're seeing a serious um, increase in input prices uh, for, for a very serious importing economy. Like was said already, Germany is a, I think you said it, Germany is an importing economy, large for its size, much larger exposure to international trade, and therefore vulnerability. Um, can our model help us explain the facts as we see them? Because as I said before, Germany has not seen these inf this inflation rate in a long, long time. Other countries, not so much. Okay, so if you look at the data, Greece had a had 20 plus inflation in 1990 before it joined the euro. Yeah? So um, this is really a new a new setup. Okay, so why don't I why don't I start by asking um, what a theory is? Okay, so what is a theory? So to me, at least, um, theory in economics is trying to do better than just someone who has an opinion on something. Because economics is so important to us in our lives that everyone has an opinion. <laughs> you know, I think this, and I, I'm a pretty good debater. I can convince you that this is right. But, uh, um, you know, we, we know from statistics that correlation um, is not, is not ca causation. And we're told that. And we should understand that. And we, the first reaction of us, of any assertion, should be, well, is that, is that just by chance? Or is there some trivial third reason that's causing both of them to move in the same direction or in opposite directions? You know, a theory is a statement about causation. A theory is a statement about translating economic sources of change into, into consequences, causes into consequences. This is, I think, a really robust uh, Summary. I, I read this um, a couple of decades ago. It's a quote by Robert King, who's a m prominent monetary economist who's had to deal with a lot of uh, papers. He was editor of the Journal of Monetary Economics for, for many years. And uh, you can imagine um, there are lots of things in macro that happen together, but what's the cause? Money grows with GDP. Does money cause GDP? Does money cause inflation? Or is it a correlate of inflation? All right. Sometimes, the, the, because we think of macro in terms of simultaneous equations, sometimes it's not a really serious question, because both are determined by a structure. Right. So the theory would give us the structure and tell us, well, in, under certain conditions, an exogenous, outside the system, change causes things to happen inside that I care about, endogenous variables. Right? So that's, that's, and that's true of micro as well. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people think that you, you can't explain preferences, so they take them as given and try to explain the demand for goods and services because of the preferences and the budget constraint. That's the way I was raised. But now we're thinking, well, maybe if I manipulate enough, maybe I can change your preferences. Maybe if you, if you interact too much with these types of agents, you might become like them. You know, So <laughs> everything can be called into question, but you have to start somewhere. So we're going to start here. Robert King. Now, here's another one. This is, those of you who have seen this already, don't blurt it out. Just, just <laughs> Somebody else said something, which I really like, and I discovered this by accident. I was like going through the book. Um, who do you think said that? So our hero, the hero of, of modern macro, the guy who sort of started it all, he said it in 1922. So this is like 14 years before the general theory was published. This is when he was a, a young uh, professor, probably, or a lecturer at uh, Cambridge, uh, writing a, 
introduction to a, a, a volume on, on contributions to economic theory. All right, so this is a really deep, you know, it's a, later on he would maybe make some shortcuts, <laughs> um, write a book that very few people could understand at the time, um, but this is um, the way I like to think about economics. It's, a, it's, not, a, it's not a religion, it's not a, it's not a doctrine, it's a, it's a way of approaching a problem, right? So that's, um, that's where we're gonna go. But why do we deal with models? Models are a way of getting to a theory quickly. Okay, so it's, a, it's um, a way of organizing our thoughts, but it makes use of compactness that you get with mathematics. Mathematics helps us transmit ideas, minimizing the use of words, maximizing the use of things that no one can contest. So, you know, uh, you, you publish a, a good paper in, in, um, in economics and you can show it to someone from, um, from a place very far from here and they may not even speak your language uh, if you can just write down the equations complex, compactly, you can convey the idea. So we're trying to be like physics, but we're not going to get there. So it's some, you know, that's the, the magic of, of what we do is that ultimately we'll never really be able to achieve the precision of physics or, or, or stochastic um, chemistry or something like that, but we'll certainly have a, a good shot at convincing, presenting, um, transmitting ideas um, using formal methods. It's an abstraction. Okay, so models don't have to be realistic, or at least they, uh, um, many of the models we'll be using in this course are not necessarily perfectly realistic, but they have a function. And the, the function would be to think of as, as a way of um, quantifying the effects and showing if they're not unambiguous and possibly even using it as a laboratory, like Prescott said, to, to actually evaluate the goodness of a theory. Okay, so we can use it as a way of falsifying, uh, generating some predictions that can be falsified. There's, there's several good examples of that, especially in macroeconomics. So the first measure of a good model is that it's falsifiable. If it's vacuous, you know, if it can't be falsified, then what, you can believe it, but you're not going to convince anybody because there's no acid test, um, no litmus test to, uh, to uh, distinguish. Because the problem with what we do is that there's a multiplicity of approaches. You can write down several theories to explain inflation. Um, some may be more flexible than others. Some may be very rigid. And the rigid ones tend to be rejected because they're too rigid. Um, but there are other, other issues as well. You could compare implications of the theory um, regarding the statistical properties of the data. For example, maybe GDP should be more volatile than consumption expenditures. That's something we'll do in this class. The life cycle hypothesis or the, the, um, the permanent income hypothesis of, of consumption, for example. It's not the last word, but it certainly works better than just assuming that consumption is a constant fraction of, of income. Okay, anybody, else, anybody have any other criteria that you'd like to throw out there? What makes a good theory? Yeah. Right, logical consistency. So that's a, um, that's a great one. It's actually on my list, but I, I thought it was the next one actually. So it's, it's um, consistency would be, um, Again, taking the axiomatic pro approach, adding a bunch of, uh, taking a bunch of assumptions and deriving the implications of those assumptions, and then asking, are those internally consistent with each other? Okay. But um, you can take falsifiability and also make it run forward and say, okay, I'm facing this oil gas crisis. Can I predict what's going to happen to, to GDP and, uh, and modern industrial economies with that? And if it fails, then we need to go back to the drawing board. Okay, so the, the failure to, to be confirmed by, a, um, a prediction to be confirmed by future events is a, is a good way of sorting out the theory. So logical consistency. Um, realism is not such a, um, it's actually a subject of contention. So a lot of, a lot of scholars debate this. How realistic do we have to be? Milton Friedman said you don't have to be realistic at all. 
In the meantime, we've come back and said, well, you know, this is, this is a bit dogmatic because maybe realism helps us cut through a lot of theories that are just nonsense. Okay, so one of the theories I'll put out there because it's good to think about is the, is the representative agent model. Okay, so it generates a whole bunch of implications under the, under the presumption that heterogeneity is a veil. It doesn't really matter. We're all behaving in the same general way. We respond the same general way to external influences like interest rates or the threat of unemployment or inflation. Um, but in fact, we know that rich people respond differently than poor people. We're pretty sure of that now. There's a lot of research here that, that has confirmed that uh, empirically. But does that matter for the macroeconomic predictions? So that's the, the debate, right? So maybe realism helps us pr develop a better model, a, a tank model, a two-agent representative agent model. Um, two, tank stands for uh, two-agent New Keynesian model, in case you're interested. Or you might want to have a Hank model, which is a heterogeneous agent New Keynesian model, which has maybe an infinite uh, variety of different agents distinguished on some metric. It doesn't make sense just to say they're different. You want to make sure that they're different in some way that makes them, that matters, like wealth, initial wealth, or access to the credit markets. Okay? So you get it. It's, um, so Friedman, Friedman's famous example was when you watch a pool player, world champion billiards or pool player, they act as if they real, they're solving complex physics, complex classical mechanics problems in their head. And he would say, well, if that model um, does a good job predicting how the pool player plays, why not just use it? Even though we know they don't do that. These guys have never taken physics, right? right. Most of them. <laughs> OK, so that's the idea behind Milton Friedman. So you'll have to deal with that. And we have this distinct advantage, which makes it fascinating to me, is that we can't do social experiments. I can't organize a hyperinflation in uh, Ukraine. I can't uh, uh, cause mass unemployment in Croatia. It just, it just uh, you don't do that. It's ethically unsound. And experimentalists say, well, I can create this lab s situation with students and pretend like they're unemployed or bargaining with their wage, with their, over their wage with their employer. But it's never the same. I mean, we'll always have this criticism. It's not. Uh, it's not uh, the real thing. So for me, there are two types of models. There's deductive, I've talked about that. You write down the assumptions, you derive the implications, maximize this, minimize that first order conditions, you gotta get some implications, and then you go out and test it. So that would be a deductive approach, okay? There's also an inductive approach, which says I observe something, and I see that there's a certain constancy of a ratio, uh, or people tend to react in a qualitative way always to this. There's some great examples from, from um, microeconomics where inductive theory has actually trumped um, deductive theory, in my view. So one of my colleagues was uh, Van Agut. Does anybody know who Van Agut is? Okay, so if you, who's interested in micro? Who's going to blow off macro for the rest of their lives? <laughs> You can be honest. I don't care. I'm not going to discriminate. <laughs> My professors always did this to us, too. Who's going who's to be a microeconomist? So Van Agut actually uh, developed this experimental test of a theory. It's called the ultimatum game. So I have 100 euros. Does anybody know the ultimatum game? OK, you know it. I'll tell it anyway. So I have 100 euros. We have this game. I say, look, I have 100 euros. I'm going to give you a part of that 100 euros. And then your move is to, to say, go to hell, walk away, or thank you very much. So the strategy space is very simple, right? Now, if you're a deductive person and you believe in <laughs> very small things matter um, and will drive your behavior always, then my optimal strategy is to give you like one cent. And you say, thank you. And you, I get to keep the rest. And if introspection would say, yeah, maybe. So Van Agut did this experiment, and he found out that the average offer was 40%. Not 40 cents, but 40%, 40 euros, something like that. 
Maybe it wasn't 100 euros. I think he, he was probably dealing with smaller quantities, which, of course, also changes the, the parameter, but makes you more jealous. If it's 100, my god, you know, the guy's walking away. So you, know, you have this threat of, um, of destroying the guy's uh, um, earnings. So t empirically, we see that, um, that it's not epsilon. Okay. Obviously, if you don't give anything, the guy's going to veto it. But if you empirically, 40% of the, of the offer means that maybe the inductive approach is not such a bad idea. Maybe we should do experiments and, and observe what people are doing, see how people react in wage negotiations. But how do you arrange that? How do you organize that under controlled laboratory conditions? Eh. Uh, stick to time series analysis. <laughs> okay. So that's the... You know, there's a, there's a great quote from Robert Lucas, my, uh, one of my heroes. He, he wrote in 1980 about writing computer programs, basically doing what we do now in macro, writing down DSGE models and s using the computer to solve them. Back then, the program was Fortran. Okay, really, I used Fortran when I was in college. Um, it's uh, pretty, pretty basic, <laughs> um, pretty primitive. Um, but his idea was we would generate data with this model and then compare the generated model data with the real data. Okay, so that's, that's a very concise uh, summary of, of that approach. Now, inductive reminds me a little bit of, of uh, Kepler looking at the stars for 10 years and figuring out that the planets don't move in circles, but they move in ellipses. Now you talk about a patient guy. <laughs> so Johannes Kepler, you know, there was this theory that the planets moved in, we, we had moved beyond the, the erdocentric theory and we're doing heliocentric, but um, everyone thought everything was a perfect circle because the circles are so beautiful. But uh, Kepler said, hey, this doesn't work, and I've, I can prove this because I've been watching Venus for, you know, for a long time, and it's just not moving as if it were a circle. So... Collecting that data, and it's a lot of data, and imagine going up into your observatory every night and writing down these, I mean, amazing. I mean, it's too bad there's no Nobel Prize back then. Uh, it's really about taking lots of data and trying to compress it into, into something we can, we can generalize. Okay, so here's the quote that I like on that approach. So the Kepler idea is not original. Wish I had thought of it myself, but I, I did know that Kepler... Uh, uh, did this, but um, one of the readings on today's uh, Moodle page basically is that reading. So if you're interested, take a look at it. By Christopher Sims, okay, who's an econometrician, uh, Nobel Prize laureate, developed um, and perfected theories of rational expectations and time series analysis, spectral analysis for use in, in time series analysis. So, you know, unbelievable uh, cont contributions in our field, but in a sense, it's a bit of a destructive statement. It's saying that um, maybe it's naive to think that we can do a bottom-up approach and test, test it on the data in any meaningful way because many other theories have the same predictions. So he's speaking in favor of data reduction, data compression. OK, so the purpose of this course is a long introduction just to get you going. I'm, it's lots, lots of fun to see. What you think, I'm going to give you the, the ideas um, that um, these things are important because they're kind of robust regardless of what course you take, what path you take in the field, uh, you can use this stuff. So game theorists use Markov processes. Um, ma ma Macroeconomists in, in any case use them. Um, if you want to do environmental research, it's, it's kind of interesting to use this approach because it's a way of summarizing the environment, a way that we can summarize what's going on and make predictions of, uh, of future events. Um, then we get more specific. We'll, we'll talk about taking time series and putting them in a certain box that make, makes it quite easy to analyze the system that's being described no matter what the model is that's generating it. Okay, that's called the state space. Uh, that's um, an extremely useful way of looking at the world. And using that state space to generate rational expectations, expe expectations that are model consistent. Okay, so that's another, we're kind of hanging on to that branch because it's the only one we have. 
is that um, as a disciplining device, assuming that the agents have access to the same model that I'm trying to figure out myself. Otherwise, we're kind of assuming the agents are dumb or not as smart as we are. Maybe they're smarter. <laughs> but in any case, we want to at least uh, be bold enough to think that, that agents, um, that we're smarter, as smart as the average agent and possibly smarter. And once you've done that, you can do all sorts of things. We'll give a, a couple of simple models. I'll use the, I'll use the permanent income model uh, of Milton Friedman and Robert Hall um, under rational expectations to generate all sorts of examples of how this setup is useful. Okay, so how, and how, how the model actually works. So this is a model that really does work pretty well um, with some caveats, okay? And maybe you, you're already thinking about, uh, I know what he's talking about. If not, that's good. Um, then we're gonna use um, that springboard as a, or that model as a springboard for reminding you how to do Lagrangian multipliers in a dynamic sense. So not just one Lagrangian multiplier, but like a whole sequence of Lagrangian multipliers from now till infinity. Okay, again, it's a construct in our heads, but it's incredibly interesting and useful because, it, oh, you know, nowadays we're in this environmental crisis, but uh, Lagrange multiplier should not be a problem to understand. I mean, if anything that's constraining us right now, it's the CO2 that we can pump into the atmosphere in total. So the CO2 stock is a, is a state variable, and there's a binding limit. If we break that limit, we're all gone. There's going to be a tipping point. We're going to have all sorts of disasters. So the value of that restriction if we could somehow relax it, that's what the Lagrangian multiplier is going to give us insight on. What is the value to an optimal program of relaxing the constraint just by epsilon? Right? Incredibly deep and very important idea. Dynamic programming is another way of stating an optimal um, program or formulating and solving for an optimal program in a, in a dynamic problem <coughs> which simplifies the the, the setup from being an infinite horizon problem to a two-period problem, also very useful. And it turns out these are equivalent. Okay, there's they're just two ways of skinning the same cat. I mean, it's the same. The same. Uh, ultimately, you get the same answer. We'll show that in one particular example. I'll show you that you get the same answer. Kind of interesting. And then we'll uh, we'll. At the end of the course, we'll probably try to propose a few new problems that are more relevant and, and current that you might be want to work on in your, um, in your research if you do this. And again, the applications are in my course, in my ha half of the course, before you start with Lutz Weinke, we'll be looking at very simple general equilibrium problems. So we'll formulate, using the representative agent idea, we will formulate the so-called Robinson Crusoe problem and we'll use dynamic uh, optimization to solve that in a very, very thorough way. And we'll use the value function approach also to solve it. And then we'll show you why this is still useful because this is the core of what we use in new Keynesian models today. So this is the, this is the, relevant, uh, the relevant core for, for understanding and working with uh, macro in the next semester, or in the next half of the semester. Okay, so when you come back, we'll break, okay? Because I've, uh, maybe some questions, you want to discuss something. Um, but um, when you come back after half an hour, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, talk about some, some stuff. I'm gonna talk about implementing this. So again, you may hate macro already, <laughs> but uh, I do think it's useful if, you, if you're confronted by your, your, one of your relatives, your great aunt comes up to you and says, you know, can you tell me something about this? And if you're a micro person and you can't, it's kind of embarrassing. It's like embarrassing when people ask me about game theory, you know, and I try to keep up. I mean, I can talk a little bit about it, but um, I can talk about the ultimatum game. <laughs> it's a great cocktail party winner, you know, or the prisoner's dilemma. Um, but you need to talk about macro. You need to be able to... So one of the ways we explain stuff in macro is... Right, so ASAD, shifting the curves. And everything you'll do after, uh, 
afterwards is, is trying to find out what, what the curves are. But the curves are kind of the thing that you can show somebody, or at least in your head, you can show it to a, someone in the ministry. Um, you know, this is what I think is happening. And then I'm going to use that as a way of thinking about the, the cycle, which is what interests us, is as, a, as the culmination of shocks. And I'll use a very simple algebraic example, not necessarily the leading example, but one to show you how that works. Okay? So why don't we take a half an hour break, unless there are questions. Any questions? So it's good to see so many people here. At least half the PhD program is here. <laughs> if, if they didn't come, tell them uh, they, they're missing something. Okay, so I'll see you in, a, in about a half an hour. <laughs>